actually just got things up and running, so we haven't even had our first question to answer yet. So you're first up. Oh man, I don't know. There's so many good questions. <laughs> Fire away. Um, I mean, my my big question, I guess, would be: I'm still trying to figure out the whole heart rate training thing. Um, low heart rate um, to increase endurance is the big thing I've been trying to figure out. Okay. Uh, what, what in specific, um, in regards to heart rate training, um, you know, I know you've got a 200 plus mile race coming up. Um, what in specific would you say is your, um, what you're looking for in terms of information about how to do the training? What are the benefits or the constructs? Um, what are you looking for there? Really, what are the the main benefits? I I started really thinking about this after reading Rich Roll's book. Okay. Um, find or uh, yeah, Finding Ultra, uh, and he was told you know that's how they uh, trained him up for the Ultraman was doing you know max of 140, um, and kind of did that and said you know don't worry hold back and then as soon as you need to go you're gonna have all the energy you need. Right. Right. So one thing to consider when it comes to, um, you know, this whole idea of heart rate training and, you know, big, long endurance events. Um, one of the things that I think a lot of people try to understand and they think that, um, you know, if Rich Roll did 140 miles in a week, then I, I've, I've got to get there. Right. And um, so I think one of the things is that Rich Roll's 140 miles a week, your 60 miles a week could be just plenty enough. And I'll, and right. I'll say this from experience in working last year, I worked with an athlete that did triple crown of two hundreds. And we did one week where he did 105 miles, but the majority of that was like hiking. There were long days. There were, they were very long, you know, six to eight hours, not every day, but you know, he had two back to back longer runs on the weekend um, that got him about 30, uh, to 40 miles in a, in a weekend. So it was two 20 milers kind of back to back, um, which was plenty, um, for him. And that was the highest week we had other than, uh, I think, you know, we got him up to the sixties pretty regularly. Um, but again, it's, I think it's completely respective of where you are as, as an athlete. This was his, you know, the triple crown ended up being his fourth when he finished Moab. Those were, his, that was his fourth um, 200 plus mile race. So he, um, he'd already had some experience in training that before, but we didn't get him much above 60, even for that first race, um, in preparation. A lot of what we knew and what we know about 200 mile races and training for them, um, really looks at, um, just time on feet. That's like the biggest thing. Like I think the mileage part of it is, is pretty pointless, especially when you start to consider altitude um, and you, you're considering like, what, what are the bigger pieces to look at? So when it comes down to it, um, really good book to look at. And I don't take all of my principles as a coach from this book. Um, but I think the 80, 20 principle is a pretty good construct in terms of like, how do we build it out? Um, and how do we look at it? 80% of it should be aerobic. 20% should be, you know, high aerobic or, uh, you know, some VO2 max, some lactate threshold stuff. Um, but I think making it more complicated than, you know, than that is, is a much, you know, much different conversation. I think when we look at it is that, um, you know, by the time you're about a month out, you should be kind of at your peak mileage, um, you know, and, and again, peak mileage, peak hours, peak time on feet, use all of those interchangeably for kind of what we're talking about here. Um, and that's do the best you can with what you have. Um, there's a lot of other complicated stuff like, you know, you could be doing more speed work early and moving towards a lot of other stuff. But honestly, when we look at the fact that we're trying to finish 250 mile race, you have to have the energy, you have to have the ability. Um, and if you come into it too tired because you're like, I'm going to do a bunch of speed work. Speed work is great for lifting your overall level of fitness, right? Like think about it. Like when you're doing VO2 max and like lactate threshold work, you're doing that work so that you can move your average pace from say like a nine minute mile to like an 840 or 845, right? And so it's not a ton of, of movement there, but every time you go through a couple of cycles of that and you're moving your average pace 
up that you're efficient, efficiently running at a lower heart rate, a zone two heart rate, um, then you, you're just moving faster, more efficiently, and that's gonna carry over in the long term for a 200, 250 mile race where it's gonna take a 23 minute mile pace down to 21, let's say. So does that kind of help answer some of the basics? Oh yeah, totally. And I mean, I'm not looking to run 140 miles in a week. Yeah. So do not recommend. Fit, no. fit, like <laughs> fit, 50, 50 sounds, you know, 50 is definitely doable um, towards, you know, the races in May. I'd be, you know, thinking 40, 45, 50, you know, April maybe to max out. And then after that would be kind of all downhill until my 250 mile week. Yeah, and I would say, you know, one of the big things to look at there would be something, um, and we can talk about more of this maybe in another call, would be um, what are some of the other modalities of training that you can add in? Um, I've got a guy that's training for a race. He lives somewhere extremely flat, and we're doing a rather hilly 65K race. We're going to add some tire drags in, some other stuff that's like he's going to go and hike and drag a tire, and that's just a way for him to get resistance because he doesn't have a ton of hills where he's at. And so that might even be something worth considering for you. Yes, you have some good climbs out there, but good resistance for hiking. Well, and Phil, I know you do a lot of split boarding and, and yeah. hiking. So I think, you yeah, know, you especially being in Vermont, you have, you have that in your backyard. Yeah. Um, so that's just kind of, you know, lean into that, especially over the winter. Yeah. Use, use that. Great. That's great hiking. Um, cool. Um, anything, anything else there, Phil? Um, no, I think that covered it. Very cool. Thank I'm going to pass off to, we have one more in the, yep. in the call right now, Amy. Phil, if after Amy's call, you have another question or something pops up, feel free to chime back in. Right on. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Miss Amy, you're still on mute. You'll have to find the unmute button. I'm going to unmute Amy. Mm -mm. I have unmuted you. Yeah, uh, really. I'm just, I'm just listening in. Oh, hey, cool. I am driving down to New Mexico to have a good weekend, and I just thought, hey, I will call in and see what other people are talking about. And oh, very cool. Learn something from what's going on. So, oh, hey, awesome. Well, glad you joined. I will. I will now put you back on mute. Uh, we'll take it over. Actually, we had a couple of questions, I think, from Instagram and Facebook. So I'll put you back on mute here. All right. Let me queue up our questions. Yeah. Um, so I think one thing um, that's really interesting to kind of talk about while uh, Lexi's pulling this up, um, and I've been thinking about a lot about is, um, I think one thing that's related here is how do we train through being sick, I think was one of them. Like, mm -hmm how sick is too sick to train and like what are the what are some of the other things to kind of consider as an athlete when you're working through um working through that so for me when when we're going out and training we got to remember that we're doing a couple of things um we're increasing our body's temperature uh we're increasing uh, our blood pressure uh but we're also uh exerting a lot of energy um, and I kind of talk to this, um, when I speak to kids, when they're growing, uh, I work with a lot of youth athletes and I try to remind them that like when your body's growing, it's not trying to become more aerobically fit. It's trying to focus on growing. Um, and so, right. We get some frustrations when we're not seeing the results that we want. And it's kind of like when you're sick, your body's trying to fight a cold, your body's trying to, you know, build antibodies and you know all sorts of crazy stuff is happening inside you that you're like i just don't feel great but i feel like i could go out for a run so for me the the hard thing um is, is everybody's got a different flavor for what a cold actually looks like it feels like for me if you have a fever like an actual fever over 100 degrees don't go out and run okay especially if it's cold if you have a cough that you know that as soon as you're done running, if it's one of those kind of coughs, it's deep in your chest and you're going to um, you know, end up having a coughing fit for 10 minutes afterwards, not worth it. Uh, you're probably gonna scar, build up some scar tissue and just do some really nasty stuff. Um, and then also if you are struggling to keep like fluids, any of that kind of stuff, like if you're sick, sick, 
don't go out and run. If you need to go like do something, just go out for a walk, go for a hike, just get some fresh air. Um, and, and that, that might feel really good. I found for me that when I'm sick, I just like to go outside and like, just feel the sun. And it's really nice and sunny here a lot. It's just nice to go out and get the sun, get a little vitamin D and it just, it makes me feel better. And I don't actually feel like I have to like go and exert a ton of energy. So I don't know what you've experienced, Lexi. Yeah, I'd say, um, and we talked about this a little bit last week too, but in general, um, light, light workouts do tend to help with the symptoms of a cold. Yeah. They help kind of flush things out. That doesn't mean that maybe you should go do your 600 workout, but it does mean yeah. like maybe an easy jog or a walk can help more than staying in bed. Um, the other thing I think is always important to pay attention to, especially as an athlete's hitting peak week, is they tend to feel a little bit run down mm -hmm. and that can kind of feel like a cold. Um, so making sure you're feeding yourself well, you're sleeping well, um, you're getting enough hydration, you're, you're paying attention to your body and you know, we're not getting that psychosomatic pre-race illness. It's yeah. more just kind of our bodies are getting tired. I'll always tell athletes like when they're like, ah, I feel like, you know, my kids have something or this and that's kind of going around. I don't feel great today. Um, I wrote, I wrote an article. It'll be out, uh, actually in the American trail running associations, uh, upcoming newsletter. And it's the idea of two days, two weeks, and two months. And this is kind of an injury slash, uh, you know, sickness thing is that it's always better to take two days off than to try to push through it and have two weeks of crappy training and kind of the same idea with an injury that if it's like my calf kind of hurts, well, see how it feels, you know, tomorrow. And if it doesn't quite feel better yet, then take those full two days of rest instead of, you know, making a strain become an injury, become a tear, and then you're out for two months. Yeah. And so it's like two days of, of rest is not, there's no miracle workouts. And if you lose those two days and you're good and you can go back to the level of training that you're at, it's far better than having a, a 90 and then an 80% week and then having two months of 0%. And that's actually a great segue to our next question. Fire up. Yeah. It's what's the best way to come back from an injury? Oof, there's, so, oh, there's a lot there. Yeah. yeah. So I think, first of all, you kind of have to look at what your injury is and mm -hmm. what you're coming. Like if you're injured early in the training season and you have you have Boston coming up or something right now, right. Um, one, I think the first thing is to do is just to reevaluate your goals um, and what you're looking for. The next thing is to start slow. Uh, don't jump back into where your training plan says you should be. Go back into where it was when you. Uh, Andrew's doing all sorts of weird things over here. I'm trying to pull the mic up because I realized it was really far away. So hopefully that helps us. Um, anyway, uh, don't jump right back into where your training plan says you should be for this particular day. Yeah. Go back to where you first had to kind of cut back because of that injury. Yeah. And I'm sure you have lots of thoughts. Um, well, I think the, you know, for anybody that's listening and maybe watching this later, um, you know, we are coaches. Um, and this is, this isn't intended to be relentless self-promotion here, but I think one of the hardest things is that when you come back from an injury, um, especially if you've like worked with a PT, you've had someone there, believe it or not, your PT is your coach in that time because they are helping you not be stupid. Um, for lack of a better word, they're kind of restraining you and saying, Hey, these are the exercises you're going to do. And here's how much activity you can do. And then you can do this and then you can do this. But after those six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks that you've been with that person, you've now left this construct. You've left this place where, you know, you are told kind of in a way what to do, how to construct your, your week. And you're kind of fed to the dogs in a way, right? You're just kind of left in the middle of nowhere and to figure it out. And I think in some ways, yes, you can absolutely go back to where you were in training, depending on the level of injury. If we're talking like you had to go under and get cut open, yeah right? That's not, you're not going to go back to doing 30 miles a week after the PT. Mm -hmm. You're going to start at a run, a run walk kind of type of thing and kind of work your way back. I think if we're talking about like a grade one, grade two, like calf tear, uh, perhaps some high hamstring tendonitis, uh, maybe, maybe shin splints tend to be kind of the common things. God forbid I say the word IT band syndrome in this, in these, uh, in, in these walls. Um, it's the things that we commonly see. And so I think what, we, what you have to determine, and this is whoever you're working with, is that what is an acceptable amount of pain to work through? And that, those, those are, you know, not, not to quote our buddy Jerry, Mr. Garcia here, but uh, it's kind of a touch of gray, right? Like you, there's a gray area between, you know, what is an acceptable amount of pain that you can run through and train through, and then what is, what is too much? 
And that's really up to you. I can't tell you it's going to feel like this if it's too much. If you're honestly, if you can't go through something as simple as the first mile without having pain that goes on the scale to like four, five, six, like I'm a three, two, one kind of guy. Like if it's a three going to a two, going to a one, that's fine. But if throughout the run it starts at a one and it's progressing, it's getting progressively worse, then you, you're not ready to train yet. It has to always be moving down uh, the scale as you're, as you're training. Um, but I think when you're kind of coming back from things, uh, I like to use the word grace because uh, you really have to give yourself the permission and the grace to like just go out for two miles and like pat yourself on the back and say, you know, that was more than yesterday when I got mm -hmm nothing in like be be willing to start really really small um and kind of test the waters every single time you go out and i think a big mistake that a lot of athletes make is trying to make up for lost time after they oh, come boy. back from an injury mm -hmm. so you know they might have been at you know doing 40 mile weeks and then they yeah. got hurt and doing a couple zero mile weeks and they're like you know i'm just going to jump up to 60 now yeah. um because i missed all those workouts or trying to double up on workouts or doing yeah. all sorts of things i think start slow do low impact so if you have access to a stationary bike the elliptical right. swimming um all things you can do that will just kind of mitigate that impact yeah and maybe avoiding those hard workouts for a little while and i'd even say um if you're actually looking for like okay give me give me something constructive here we talked about it what can i actually do so if you're a, a 25 mile a week runner uh, and you're coming back from an injury and you're running every other day two to three miles right we're talking in in a if you got in four days that week, that's 12 miles. So how do I get from 12 to 25? Um, consider that those days in between, they don't have to be complete rest days. Use them as a way to cross train and look at this in a function of time. How long did it take you to run those 25 miles in a week? Can you then use the other time that's not there on the bike, in the pool, and do that cross training and then kind of set up over the next month that you're taking away 15 minutes, 20 minutes a day from that. So if you're doing an hour in the pool, then you're gonna do 40 minutes and you just go for a 20 minute swim. And then you're gonna add back one day of maybe two to three miles. And this, none of this is workouts. None of this is hard and fast. This is truly just aerobic work and kind of blending that back until you're at that 25 again. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no such thing as you know, makeup miles. They just don't exist. I'm sorry, they don't. Nope. <laughs> Um, anything more on injuries? Uh, I think that's enough. Uh, so the last question we have from Instagram is how does alcohol affect your training? So there's a few different th ways we can talk about this. Yeah. One is, um, I think a lot of us, we know that elite runners tend to cut out alcohol and sugars and all sorts of crazy things when they're training for an event and there's nothing wrong with that. However, I also always encourage my athletes to keep living their normal life. Yeah. Um, you know, suddenly cutting out everything may not make you the happiest person. So also remember that you're a well-balanced human being. Along with that, alcohol is a diuretic as is coffee, which I drink a lot of, uh, which means we kind of dehydrate ourselves. So if you are a nightly beer drinker, or you like to have a glass of wine every few days, it's just important to make sure you're getting lots of water with it, making yep. sure you're kind of flushing that out. Um, of course, alcohol is also a toxin. Yep. So our bodies go into hyper mode, trying to metabolize it, get it out and really stresses our all of our organs, yep. our livers especially, which makes training the next day not the most fun thing. Yeah. So uh, it's always a, uh, I like to have a beer to celebrate my long run for the week, but I like to have a little bit of food before it, like to have some water and not have it the night before the long run. Yeah. I, so I think, um, I think you kind of hit it on the head. I think one of the things is there's, there's a balance in all of this, like one beer now and again, like even if you're training and you're training hard for an event, like it's not going to ruin your training. You know, I've seen people that are like, oh, I take a caffeine taper and I don't drink caffeine for three weeks. I would be unbearable if I couldn't drink it would my be coffee. Murder here. Yeah, it would be terrible. Like, I know for me that if I'm going to taper back my caffeine so I feel like it has an effect in, in my gel, and I'm, I'm saying, I'm talking a race that's under three hours long. I get it for a hundred mile race. Like, it's everything is magnified sure. to an extent. But even then, like, it's your morning cup of coffee. It's how you wake up. Like, don't, don't take all the joy out of life in pursuit of a single event. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not going to the Olympics. Like you're not going to the Olympics and we train a lot of really normal people. So the way I look at this is that 
if if you're having alcohol in excess, right? Like you're like if you got really drunk the night before and then you think that hey, I'm gonna go out and get a workout in, yeah, it's not gonna not gonna be great. But I've also trained brewers, people that have to drink for a living, mm -hmm. right? They're tasting that this is a part of what they have to do. And so I think part of it is just make sure that you're you're kind to yourself that mm -hmm. you're hydrating, that you're putting in what you take out because of alcohol. I think the other thing that when it comes with alcohol is um, we tend to metabolize alcohol into fat. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it can be really tough if you're trying to do a ketogenic diet, if you're trying to do all these other things and you're throwing in a, a hard, high carbohydrate, high, you know, low fat metabolism, um, you know, that diet you're trying to do and you're, you're having something that's going to metabolize directly into fat. It just, it can kind of throw things off a little bit. And I think that's for people, it can interrupt sleep. Mm -hmm. But at the same thing too, if you remove something, it can interrupt sleep. So there's a lot to be considered with alcohol, but I think as long as it's a, a glass of wine with dinner, you know, those kind of things, we've all, we've all seen the articles, right? Apparently chocolate and wine and all the things that we're supposed to not enjoy about our lives are actually good for us in moderation. So I, I'll say this, I'll leave it at that. Everything in moderation, including moderation. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm just pulling up the next question. Cool. I know I've had athletes, um, like I had a bunch who live in St. Louis and when the blues were in the Stanley cup, they were just kind of like, Hey, we're probably not going to do our hard workouts this week. And it's yeah. all, planning ahead like that. If you have a wedding that you're going to, and you know, you're going to be up late, even if you're not necessarily drinking, right. just being kind to yourself and knowing that you can change your running schedule a lot more than you can change your life schedule. Yep. Um, so well, sorry. It's all good. Um, you know, I think uh, I think one of the questions that we'll we'll at some point have have on this uh, is uh, what diet? Oh yeah, is the best diet for runners. I have lots of opinions on this. Um, <laughs> I'll let you go first. <laughs> well, I am I, I'm a 12 year vegetarian plant based food guy. You are. I follow intuitive eating and eating everything. So I will say this, I think a lot of what it comes down to with diet is what is your relationship with food? And then everything after that kind of comes down to personal preference, right? Like for me, you know, I, I was 218 pounds mm, sophomore, junior year of college. So for me, it was like, I wasn't happy. I wasn't doing a lot of endurance exercise. This was not, this is who I am today and who I was then are completely different. But what I had to change wasn't just, I didn't lose the weight because I started eating a more whole foods plants, plant-based diet. Did that help? Absolutely. But what I had to change first was my relationship with food. I had to change that when I didn't feel good, um, when I was feeling overworked because I took way too many credit hours and things like that. I used to cope by like, let's make bacon, mac and cheese and solve this overworked feeling. Like you had, I had to change how I looked at that and say, you know what? I probably just need to go outside for a walk and just not stare at this physics problem for another two hours and just drive it into my brain and got to give myself right that grace. So I would say that before you look into the whole foods diet or whatever is next, all of it comes down to restricting calories in order to lose weight. If you're trying to say what is the healthiest diet, it's got protein, fat, and carbohydrates in some you know some order. Um, you know, if you're working out hard, you have to have more protein in your diet. You have to repair that. If you're trying to run fast and run fast very often, marathon training, 5K, 10K, half marathon training, you need a higher, usually a higher carbohydrate diet. If you're pushing a lot of carbs through your system, it's not going to feel good if you're doing a ketogenic diet. So mm -hmm. look at what works best for you and your relationship with food and we'll leave it at that. Well, if I can go on my tangent for a second. Tangents are allowed. Uh, I came from working, in, oh, your career's going to die. I came from working in, in the eating disorder field, um, mental health field. And again, it, a lot of it comes into what is really your relationship with food and why do you want to go on that diet? Um, why are you running lots of miles? And just really examining what the benefit could be and where, where it's going to take you. Um, if you're feeling as though you're just not in a healthy place or that your relationship with food isn't healthy, uh, maybe worth looking more with a dietitian or someone who can help you 
you know, navigate that in a smart way rather than cutting out calories, uh, especially if you're training for an endurance event. If you're starting, we're training for your first marathon or getting into ultras, cutting out food from your diet is going to be incredibly detrimental to your muscle development. Um, so just making sure that you're doing it in a wise way. Uh, with intuitive eating, the idea is that you, you just eat things in moderation and you eat what you feel is right for that time. Um, so there's no restrictions. Um, I mean, you can have a dessert every night if that's what makes you happy. Uh, but just making sure that you're not eating muffins for breakfast every morning as well. Um, so we're plugged in there. And I think that was all the questions we had sent to us this week. Is there anything else that, in case anyone pops up yeah, over the feel, next few minutes? Feel free to unmute yourselves. We're, we're 22 minutes into this thing. Um, so if we don't have any, I'll, I was actually going to speak to, um, one thing that tends to come up. Um, and I think one of the things that I stress a lot as a coach, um, is so where does strength training fit? And there are definitely two sides to this. Um, and I think more so in the last five years, I've seen a lot of athletes, um, I mean, with the social media side of things that a lot of athletes are like, strength training is a big part of what we do. And I think that as I look at it, there's a time and a place for it. You, right now, right, we're at the end of January. If you've got a May, June race, now is your time to kind of be packing on a little bit of muscle. It's, it's okay to kind of pack on muscle and, you know, be able to, uh, spend some time working away in the weight room because, um, once that mileage starts to pick up, um, you'll, you'll lose any of that really, you know, excess muscle. Um, but what you want to have there is that support structure that if you don't have muscle there now, if you don't have well activated muscles there now, um, it's a good thing to be doing. I think one of the big things that I've also learned too, is I've kind of developed more of a, uh, I guess, system of how I train and how I work with athletes. Um, I find that a lot of runners, um, and those that are going into the trail running world, or even like, you know, Amy, you do a lot of snowshoeing and things. Um, we really find that where runners are the weakest is in lateral movement, side to side, uh, in that sagittal plane. Um, we're really good at going forward for a really long time and maybe even going up and down. But as soon as we have to like move left really quickly and not forward to like, got to get over, there's a rock in my way, or there's, you know, um, I'm coming downhill and I've really got to be able to move my feet quickly. We can actually take a lot of the same stuff that we see football players, that we see hockey players, um, you know, all of these power sports, right? Because it's a powerful movement to move laterally. It's not super, you don't have to be powerful to move forward. Um, so what I would say is that things like um, you know, putting a small circle band around your ankles, um, or even underneath the knee and doing some lateral work. Um, it's really going to fire those glutes up. That's, that's one of the main primary drivers, um, for lateral movement, but also super important for us, you know, glute med, glute min, glute max, um, all of those kind of fire together in some way, especially in, when we were trail running. Um, but it's also another that we also need to either get that system to work together. Then also the front of the hip, um, you know, the psoas, the hip flexor, all of that area, you can't ignore that either. So doing things, um, especially if you know that you're going to be doing um, really long races, like 50, 100K, 100 mile races in the mountains and things like that. Um, and again, going kind of looking at snowshoeing is don't forget about things like plyometrics and not just from the standpoint of a plyometric must mean a box jump. It doesn't, it really doesn't. What I want you guys to see with a plyometric is something as small as a jump rope, like doing some basic jump roping movement. We talked about this last week. Um, I know we don't have audio from it, but we talked about it. It was mentioned. <laughs> it was mentioned. Um, what we're trying to do with something as simple as jump roping is, you know, get those lower leg muscles firing, get some, you know, good, you know, fascia movement. Um, but also with the feet, you know, the first couple of things that tend to tire out for someone in their 50 mile, 100K, 100 mile, or even, you know, shorter events 
are going to be the main joint movers. Our knees rarely get tired because they're used to kind of moving in that way. They're a spring. We've done this since we were babies. But when we're always having to kind of have our foot in dorsiflexion with toes kind of pointing up, that ankle, that joint can get really sore from constantly having to hold our foot up, especially if we're going up a lot of stairs and climbing a lot that extra pressure of not having been on flat ground and you're always trying to not hit your toes um, is can get really fired up. But then what's the next thing? Think at the top of the chain, the hip flexor gets hit a lot. So doing things like um, a box step up where you're just going to step onto a box in like suitcase carry position, weight by your sides, um, or even doing um, like a, a box step up and make it a little more complicated and add a knee drive of the opposite leg that was on the ground that you know, you pushed off with and then you're driving it. It's a compound movement, mm -hmm. but so much of that, when you add the weight, that resistance is what's going to help you at mile 80, get to mile 100. Whereas, you know, just going out and going for another run, it's not going to make a whole lot of difference at mile 80. It's the, it's what do you have support structure wise? And I always seen strength training as kind of a way to bulletproof your body. Mm -hmm especially this time of year. Um, and I think once you get into the season, I, I always like to prescribe kind of those injury prevention strength training. Yeah. It's a lot of body weight uh, for trail runners, especially. I love things that involve stabilization and just like making single sure leg work. Exactly. Um, chair lunges are some of my favorite or even um, single leg squat jumps and things like that that are different. So it's mixing it up yeah. a little bit. You can do them at home. You don't need to go to the gym. And then you're just making sure that you're staying healthy and stable and kind of waking up those ankles for when you're on the trail. Right. I think that's one of the most common injuries with trail runners. I mean, yeah. we can prevent the other things more easily, but you can't really prevent you twisting your ankle. Right. Yeah. And I think, um, ankle strength, you know, hands down, my favorite movement is just getting a band, whether that's, mm -hmm. you know, a small circle band or one of the much larger, like three foot sure. bands, um, is something as simple as like a windshield wiper yeah. movement where you're just, trying to take those pinky toes and work them towards the floor and work them towards the floor. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of like gas pedal where you're going to have the band over the front of your toes and you're getting that resistance. So you're strengthening mm -hmm. um, all the muscles that help pull your foot up and your toes up. Mm -hmm. um, because once those shut down, your foot's basically kind of just hanging down mm -hmm. and it's going to catch on a whole bunch of stuff. And you're going to go down and then you're cursing the trail and crying and a lot of, yeah. a lot of sadness. Yeah. yeah. And I think core work is always important. Uh, with your posture and running and just yeah. staying healthy. Um, another question that came up. Oh, you're ready for it. Yeah. Yeah, let's fire away. Uh, side stitches. Why do we get them and how do we deal with them? Yeah, I got I got some great ideas. <laughs> All right. So I'd say one of the biggest reasons for side stitches is just the shallow breathing or not mm. warming up correctly. Mm -hmm. um, as well as I think hydration might be the, the third, especially in the summer. So if it's a hot day, making sure that you're not just drinking a glass of water right before you go out, but that you're drinking the night before, you're drinking some of that morning, you're you're making sure that you're staying hydrated. I'm an not, ounce per mile guy. Yeah. Right? Like if you got if you're gonna go out for a 16 mile run or a 20 mile run, yeah. No excuse not to take a big bottle or a medium sized bottle. It's just a when it's really hot, upwards of two ounces a mile. It sounds like a lot, mm -hmm. but that's like basically a, a moderate sized mouthful of water for most people. For sure. Every mile, that's really not that hard to manage. If you're doing track work, as always, I think bringing your bottle out to the track. Yep. Um, you know, if you're doing something, you can do loops around your house, even if it's a shorter run. Um, but a lot, aside from that, I'd say breathing incorrectly. Um, a lot of that comes from us kind of hunching over when mm. we're running. If we have a desk job, we tend to have a, a real problem doing that. Yeah. Um, so a lot of chest openers, getting your shoulders back, making sure that you're going into the run with a good posture and that you're strong. Um, balloon breaths are always something I encourage, which... We breathe in deeply to where it's hurting. So we're, yeah. like I always tell athletes to visualize like your breath going into that place. Obviously, that's not how breath works, but breathing into the place and then like you're blowing the balloon out. So you're just kind yeah. of getting in that full deep breath. Um, as we're breathing harder and harder, we tend to kind of give ourselves that oxygen. So if we're panting, we're right. not we're not doing good things for our body. Yeah, I'll I'll go along with that breathing thing before I get into a little more complicated stuff. Um, is I, I instruct also like in through the nose, out through the mouth, just because it tends to, otherwise they go, <sighs> and they take like a big gulp of air. And like, sometimes when you do that, it'll actually go into your stomach and then you're going to burp. And then that might create some more pain that you don't need. So you're easy in through 
filling all the way up and then really easing it out. I kind of think like when you're getting a massage and they hit that one spot and you got to like breathe through it, it's kind of the same idea with a side stitch, but I'm actually going to stand up and hopefully the camera will capture all this. But um, being a form guy, one of the things that really comes to mind for me um, is actually how we run. We tend to get side, we don't get side stitches very early when we're running. We tend to get them when we're fatiguing. So a couple things to kind of consider, and hopefully you guys can see me in here, um, is that when we're running, um, a couple things happen, and I'll give it to you in this view first, is that when we get tired, the first thing we do is we start to kind of roll our shoulders. But what that also does is that that cr crunches basically our sternum and all of our guts and abdominals and things into our diaphragm. So we've kind of arrested that diaphragm to only a certain amount of movement. And so once we have that crunched diaphragm and we're kind of rolling down here, it's tight. And so people are like, my side stitch kind of feels like it's, it's right here, coach. It's like, it, they, it's always right underneath the rib, right up by like the, the first major abdominal, um, kind of almost in the obliques area. And some of that could be a hydration issue if you're having like some pain there. But for me, the next thing that always tends to come with that is that form is degrading. So we've gone from having this nice, strong, straightforward form to now we're like hunched and we're either rolling or we're kind of crossing the body with our arms. And so when we're doing this like cross body kind of thing, I've, I mean, you see it, watch the finish of any local half marathon, especially after the two hour mark, people are really hunched over and they're, they're just driving with their shoulders. And I, you know, no wonder they're cramping because imagine for two hours, if you just sat here and did this, okay? And then now you're hunched over, where does that hit you? It hits you right here every single time. You're fatiguing a muscle that's not used to being both rotated and then expanded and contracted. And so what a lot of people really need to do there, and it's a core strength, it's also understanding that their posture, they need to get, stand up, proud chest, and really keep those arms driving forward. So what about a 100 mile, 200 mile race? Well, with a pack, right? And you got this thing on your back, it's like pulling you over. So why one, it's great to have poles and make sure that when you're using your poles that they're the correct size for you. If they're too high or they're too low, you want to have them so that you're about 90 degrees um, and just really feeling comfortable with them. But you want to avoid that, that hunch, that slump that happens right when you kind of crunch everything in there. It's just not, that's where most of the problem is rooted from that I've found. Um, and it's, it's more about also that panic breathing that like when you get a ha 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 that really high breath that fast breath you can change the cadence of that just like you can change the cadence of your feet when you're running and like just to kind of what you mentioned there um we're kind of starving that oxygen so that also adds to the like oh my god this feels worse you're all your you know your, your body's not finding homeostasis yeah, and your not. heart rate's kind of going whoa we need oxygen it's like getting to the top of a climb of a hill mm -hmm. And then just thinking you're going to keep pegging it on the way down. Like I've always found like at the top of the hill, like two or three nice deep breaths. And like, like I just try to think like I'm pushing, like I'm blowing out all of like, and this is totally a weird thing to say because I realize people are going to listen to this. But like, I always think like I'm blowing out like all of um, like all of the deposited carbon in my body. I know it's such a weird thing to think about, but like I think about it like when you see a diesel truck start up. Like that's what I think of in my brain. Like all of that bad stuff that's like loaded up in my legs and lungs and I'm burning right now like in a 5K. And I get to the top of that like hill or climb and then I just, and like mentally, it's kind of that mental imagery that I use to kind of push that out and then I can get back to like my rhythm. And like there's a construct of like start and end of the hill is now done and I can get back to racing. Same thing, I always, I, I'm, kind of hippy dippy so I always tell people to like breathe out a bad color breathe in a good color Ooh. and you picture your body filling up with a good color so you're getting in those deep breaths the other thing is I always tell people shake out yeah if shake you feel out. like things aren't feeling good just shake out yeah, uh top of hills mile marks all yeah. those fun things so what's your what is your what's your good color what's your bad color uh I like teal and I usually breathe out kind of like a brown gray yeah like just kind of like probably diesel exhaust yeah diesel exhaust um another question we have um so after coming back from an injury or illness, how do you decide if you should still race? Mm. This, is, this is a good one. I think 
one one factor that definitely plays in here is the uh how close to the race are you um if you're within a week and it's been a major like you got influenza and you've been out for two weeks depends on the distance mm -hmm. i'm not going to put you if, if 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 you were my athlete i wouldn't put you in a marathon i wouldn't put you in a half mm -hmm. marathon we can talk about a 10k maybe mm -hmm. um and it really depends on have you been able to get in any training how are you feeling in those training efforts things like that what are your thoughts yeah i would say what what race are you looking to do like i was sick for my second boston but i was in boston and i was like well i can deal with a respiratory infection for 26 miles not the best idea not gonna be a great race but i went into it saying this isn't going to be my best race. yeah i think you have to shift your expectations exactly. to how sick you've been yeah um i think a lot of people they're like i'm better yeah and then how many i mean i can't tell you how many times i thought i was better and then i went out on a long run mm -hmm. and it's kind of one of those in your same situation you were probably more sick so after mm -hmm. boston because when you go out and do a long run you're like cashing your immunity. Mm -hmm. Like you're going to the immunity bank for a 20 plus mile run, like three hours, four hours, five hours of running. It's going to diminish your immunity. And so you're more susceptible to getting sick. Mm -hmm. If you're already sick and you're like, you got like one white blood cell that's like hanging around, like mm -hmm. don't just take me out. We're done. Like you're gonna, it's not going to be good. So I would definitely say like, can you afford, mm -hmm getting sick after this race, does it impact any other future races? Right. If it's going to impact your A race, and this is some, you know, total, like you're going to go do a Ragnar relay with some friends and you were sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Find, find another person to do the relay with. But if it's like, this is your A race. Yeah. You've put in the training, you put in the hours to get to this point, see if you can get more sleep, kind of salvage things around and see if you can still work out a good performance mm -hmm. or adjust your goals. Absolutely. Just be willing to adjust your goals. Or, and I think also if you say maybe had a flu during peak week, mm. you can probably still race your race. However, again, it, you know, you still had all that time leading up, but your recovery coming back may not be what you think it is. Oh yeah. Um, so be kind to yourself, pay attention to your heart rate. Don't try and oh, yeah. like squeeze in that extra long run. Um, see no makeup miles. See, there's no a, there's miles. a pattern here, guys. Um, there's another one. I'm going to pull up my Instagram here. I know no one's like checking this out in like live time, which is okay. Okay. So when you're getting ready for a, a long trail race, but it's in the distance, when should you start training more on trails and how much should you be training on roads? Mm. I think that's a question we've gotten a few times from a few athletes over the past month. Yeah. When do you get specific? Mm -hmm. um, why don't you start this up? Yeah. This I think the most important thing is to build up your base first. Um, especially in the winter, we don't have access to all the trails if you live in a colder place. Yeah. Even now, it's been beautiful and sunny in Colorado, but those trails are still icy. Yeah, a lot um, of ice. So if you're training for something this summer, whether it's June, July, August, I would say just getting those miles on the road or the treadmill right now is totally a-okay. Um, again, building up that strength training for something more specific. Um, I don't think it's ever too early to practice carrying a pack. Um, however, I would say maybe two months out from the race, two to three months, you can start getting more specific, especially on those long runs. Um, if we run every single training run on the trail, when there's just not enough time in the day to get in those miles, um, it may not be convenient to do that for every single run unless you live, you know, right up in mm -hmm. the woods. And again, that's just going to be hard on your body. Right. Um, so maybe taking those easy days more on the roads. Yeah. doing your specific workouts um if you're doing trail tempos if you're doing hill work if you're doing the long runs more on the yeah. trails i'd say for those that are in a cold more northern climate um know know what days matter know the quality days in your workout and i actually i'm, a, I'm the kind of a person where um you know even living here in colorado where it's it's cold but it's beautiful it's nice it's, it's sunny out I want to go get on the road mm -hmm. actually and go get my workouts in on the road and do my tempos and all that stuff because I like, I, I get affirmation from seeing what my watch mm -hmm. is telling me and some, and I want to transfer that over into later in mm -hmm. the summer. I want to, I know I need to remember how to feel mm -hmm. like how should a tempo feel. And then when I go get on the trail and I'm not seeing those paces I was seeing early in the season, 
but the effort level is still the same. And like, I, I'm, I'm feeling the same, you know, either long burn or the, you know, just this, the, the power that's coming out of my legs. I know I'm doing fine. I know I'm doing the work I need to do. That's how a tempo is supposed to feel. That's how intervals mm-hmm. are supposed to feel. I'll do that kind of work on the road. And then my easy days, um, I'm more than happy to go out on the trails, mm-hmm. carry a pair of micro spikes and not be like, oh my God, this is going to slow my pace down to do this icy uphill for the next mile. I'm gonna stop, put my spikes on, make sure I'm safe, make sure I'm smart. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, keep going. Or if it's really deep snow, I don't care if I'm doing 13 minute miles. Sure. Right. I'd say just being careful. It's not taxing your body too much. On sure. Those easy days is the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the only weird balance that yeah. I have. You've got to, you've got to be willing. And I think, I think the thing that comes with, with trail running and you know, this also mm-hmm. definitely applies to ultra running is that effort to walk a mile in the snow that's shin deep is just as hard as some of your faster miles. Mm-hmm. So you just have to know kind of what that level of exertion is mm-hmm. and you know, just don't, don't push it, like you said. Um, so how do you deal with training and working shift work? So that question came from someone who's a night nurse. And I know both of us have worked night shifts and worked yeah. 12-hour shifts. So uh, I would say for me, one of the biggest lessons I learned was to, to make sure I was sleeping. Um, mm-hmm. It's important to get those workouts in and to, uh, you know, train. Um but if I'm not sleeping, I'm not going to get any benefit from that workout. Yeah. Um, deciding when the best time of the day for you to work out is. If you can do it right after and still get to bed, yeah. perfect. I always had to go straight to sleep yeah. um, and then get up and work out before I went back into work. Um, you know, making sure that you're eating well, which yeah. is hard when you get off work at 7 a.m. Um, and that you're not over caffeinating. Yeah. So I, I'll, um, so when I was in college, I, I did a lot of like weird swing shifts where I'd learn, work like seven P to seven A. And then two days later I'd work seven A to seven P. So my body never knew what I was throwing at it. And what I ultimately learned from that was, um, understanding like when my body's ready to perform, when is my body actually going to be most receptive? And sometimes that meant when I'd finish an overnight shift, I was totally fine. Mm-hmm. I felt like I had energy, but if I was on my third day of back to back to back night shifts, I'm going to bed. Day off. Like I, I want a day off and you know, you've, I'm going to wake up and I know I'm going to feel a lot better. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think part of it is that, you know, challenging, you know, yourself to be honest about, um, are you going to get a quality workout in? I think that's one of the biggest strategies is just know like, we get it. You're tough. Mm-hmm. If you're, if you're doing night work and you're running an ultra, you're a total badass in my book. Right? Yeah. Like I, I couldn't do that. Like I'm such a wimp when it comes, I need my sleep. Um, at least now. Um, so I know that if I don't have a good night's sleep, I'm going to move that workout a day. If I know that I've got like, you know, a day off in the middle of the week, you know, it's a good day to do the hardest workout of your week. Mm-hmm. And if you've got a day off in the weekend, great place to fit that long run in as long as you're not going to make yourself too tired so that you're going into your shift exhausted. So it's about kind of saying, you know, you have to do a little robbing of Peter to pay Paul at times, but I think we all do it. It just seems different for shift work, right? We still all have the same 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And the benefit of working those, if you're doing three twelves or even four twelves is that you also have all those days off. Right. So get some good sleep and then you can just make sure you're getting in some awesome workouts and, but I would also say the trap there too is that if you have four days off in a row, don't try to cram seven days of training no. into four days. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> don't 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 think yeah. that that's what we're saying in this. We're saying that give yourself the grace to take that good night's sleep, get that eight ten hours that you need from being up all night, and whether that's adopting to a more daytime schedule, and then you know for th- two days or whatever it is, and then transitioning back because our bodies love patterns. Mm-hmm. That's why if anybody's ever if any of my athletes are listening, it's like. Tuesdays and Fridays, we do workouts. And then these days we do the easy days and this day is our long run. And it's almost always those kind of structures because, uh, your body loves that rhythm. You know, you're going to go to bed, you're going to eat differently on Monday night to prepare for Tuesday morning. Whereas if you're just like, I'm gonna do a workout today. Mm -hmm. Well, that spastic way of thinking ends up just like your body's like, I don't don't know how to handle this. Mm -hmm. And you end up just kind of running kind of hard, kind of often. Yeah. Um, so another one we've been getting frequently is why do I need to take a day off? 
because I said so. <laughs> no, um, yeah, day offs. They are, they're tricky. They're tricky. tricky. Um, I think it's a common trap for a lot of people once they start to get really, you know, they start to see success is they want to just run every single day mm -hmm. or, you know, it's how we deal with things. It's how we deal with stress. It's More is better, do. right? Always. More is better. And I feel crazy if I don't run. I feel antsy. I, I can't handle not running. And I think those are things we always hear. Yeah. Um, you're going to feel even more crazy when you get a stress fracture yeah. and can't run at all. Yeah. For three months. Yeah. Um, and that's usually what I say, but also along with that, like our bodies need to recover. Um, if you absolutely cannot take a single rest day, like mm. you feel like you will lose your mind. That's when I always encourage going for a walk, yeah. um, doing really gentle, easy, easy, easy yoga. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of our coaches, Nicole, what she said was if you have to put on something special to do that workout, you shouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, she said like at the you can put on a swimsuit to sunbathe at the pool but don't go swimming um what about my favorite underwear i'm just kidding um no i i think off days and learning how to take off days it's a skill right it's absolutely a skill to know when your body needs to rest but you know what i think even more so is um getting no no playing two moves ahead, mm -hmm. know the chess of training and knowing that, you know, I've got a next week's, I'm going to go up five miles next week. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take a rest day because now I'm going to need some energy or knowing that, you know, yeah, I could go out for a four mile run tomorrow, but I've got that 20 miler the day after this off day. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to feel good for that. And mm -hmm. so it's kind of, you know, I don't like to use the bank reference. You're not banking energy by any means. Um, you know, you're not also not banking mileage by making up days. There's a rhythm here. Mm -hmm. Um, off days are absolutely necessary just as good sleep is. It's part of periodization. When you build, 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 you don't get the, the response mm -hmm. if you don't come back down. You're not, this is, you're not, you know, you're trying to go to the moon. Yes. Mm -hmm to the marathon, but every once in a while, like I kind of think of it more like you're diving, mm -hmm. right? Like you have to like repressurize every once in a while and like get back to a homeostasis. Otherwise you're going to burst your eardrums. And you know, the same thing can be said for coming up too fast. Mm -hmm. You've got to, you know, take those breaths. You've got to chill out for a little bit, climatize and then get back to it. Because if you think you're going to go 50, 60, 70, and then the next week you're going to go 80 it, for whatever reason you're doing that, trying to get to 80, you're going to break and you're going to break down because it's a cumulative amount of fatigue. Mm -hmm. So I would say that if you're not someone that's going to take a rest day every week, while I encourage it and think it's healthy, maybe blend that into cross training. If you're someone that's doing regularly 60, 70, 80 miles, think about taking one inside your period of buildup inside those three weeks, take one to three rest days within there. Um, what you don't want to end up doing is having to make those three rest days yeah. back to back to back because right. you overdid it. Right. And I think cross training is great, but um, it also can be a workout. So yeah. think about what you're doing and how it fits into your training. I love to backcountry ski, but I also know that that's not a rest day. That's, yeah. a, that's a workout day. Yeah. And while I may not get the miles I wanted to that week, if I choose to do that instead of a run, it's still, it's still fatiguing my body. For sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, just gotta be, you gotta be nice. Like right now I'm working through some weird post tibial tendon stuff and I've had way more rest days than I've had training days lately, but I don't really let it stress me out. Mm -hmm. I think part of it is that I've, I've been through another mm -hmm. injury before when I broke my foot that I'm like, you know what, if I do push it right now, I might be extending it. And I'll go back to that two days, two weeks, two month mentality. Like, I'm just going to pump the brakes because it's also January. I'm getting ready for Pikes Peak Ascent. You've got Leadville 100. If either of us right now think that we're going to get our biggest mileage and like nope. all of that, like it's just, it's not like just chill. Yeah. Like find other hobbies, man. Yeah. Like you do a lot of backcountry skiing in the winter yeah. for me. I like, like to cook. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Chill out. Like I get it. Everybody wants to be at the top of their game, yeah. but you can't live at the top for forever. And like, I, you know, having come from 
you know, both training a lot of athletes and, you know, having trained a lot myself over the years, whether that be for Ironman or for like, you know, marathon training, giving yourself that one day is so, so necessary, but also be more than be multifaceted, Mm -hmm. you know, have other skills. Like, and I see this a lot in kids that I coach is that I so, so, so encourage them to not just run. I, they love it. And they're like, this is the one thing I want to do. And I'm like, don't like, I know how to ride my bike really well. I know how to swim really well. I know how to run really well. I can kind of hang on for skis going uphill, not downhill. Um, be able to do a lot of stuff mm-hmm. because sometimes all that other stuff might be all you have. Like right now I can ski, I can swim and I can ride the heck out of a bike. And that's what I'm doing. I'm using, I actually really love Zwift, mm-hmm. right? Like it's a really fun kind of engaging way to kind of get on the bike and do something different. I'm keeping my cardio intact. I'm engaged, but I'm not doing more damage to this, whatever's going on with my ankle thing. Like I just got to give it some rest. And I think that's where you need to be careful with things like Strava or Instagram, where you see people yeah. out there every single day and we get into that comparison trap. And I mm. think that's where I, I have seen athletes struggle the most is they're yeah. like, well, this person seems to run seven days a week. Why am I only running five? Oh yeah. Um, so how do you deal with that? Well, I always go back to the quote that I think impacted me the most that, you know, comparison is the thief of joy. It'll take out all of the fun that you have if you're always looking and saying, okay, that guy that was in front of me in the 5k, I follow him on Strava and oh God, he went out and did, you know, 20 by 400. Well, shoot, I need to go out and do 20 by 400. No, you don't. I promise you don't. Um, What you have to do is understand that your training is unique to you and that that whole comparison thing, like even in business and things like that, I see other coaching companies are doing this stuff or other, other coaches are over here and all, and you know, we can all get distracted by what's happening uh, over there, but we always end up losing ourselves from that. We never gain in that comparison uh, trap of things. We always end up being the thing that actually gets, gets lost here. We feel lonely, we feel shut down. And I feel bad for the kids that grow up with this because I didn't. And I see the effects it has on me as an adult. And what I end up doing is I, if I see something that I like, don't use the word triggered because it's a really like, there's a lot of weird stuff that's kind of associated with that. But when I actually have a reaction and I see something and it makes me upset, I reflect on that for a second and I go, what is making me upset about this? And then I go, do I, is that, is this making me better? Is this, is this kind of content? So like, if I go on to Facebook and I see something political or I see something that's just like, like, Oh, I, ugh, this, this, ugh, right. You get that like it, it, reaction. I just unfollow it. I mute it for 30 days. And if it comes back 30 days later and it still makes me feel that way, then I definitely unfollow it. Mm-hmm. If there are people on Strava that I'm seeing and I'm like, I find myself going, Oh, that, or when I get one of those notifications that someone stole my whatever, it, it can fire you up and it can be a motivator for training. I get it totally. But is an all out 15 second effort behind the pizza hut really worth it? It's really not right. Like it doesn't matter that much. Right. And you also, it kind of feels weird that when you get that, you're like, Ugh, why, why do I care so much about this darn pizza hut route? It, it's just, it, it, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a thing that we as humans, we, we want to be the proudest monkey. It's like this, big deep thing and it's just you know it's not worth it so we're wired to have automatic negative thoughts or ants um yeah gonna pull out some of that mental health training here um so when we see things on social media we as much as we want to as good human beings because we're all good human beings right Right. we want to be like man good for so and so for taking that cr like they ran it better than me they're stronger than me awesome i have my own strengths that's how we want to think, but we don't. We think, I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I should be training harder. Right. And those are the stories we tell ourselves. That's, I always tell athletes to be aware of that at, when they hit right. the wall at mile 20 is what are we telling ourselves? What stories are we saying? Yeah. Um, and it takes a lot of actual mental training to work on not just falling into those automatic negative thoughts and to like really become mentally strong. Yeah. And I think social media is actually a really great way to practice it. Sure. Is to look and acknowledge that thought, acknowledge. You gotta catch yourself, right? Yeah, wow, that person won that race. That's really good for them. Why am I upset by this? Mm-hmm. And then once you kind of start to like develop that awareness in yourself, it kind of start. it becomes, you know, then you're able to have not an automatic positive thought, 
but a positive thought following that automatic negative right thought. you can kind of redirect it but you yeah. have to be you have to be of the mindset to catch those mm -hmm. negative thoughts kind of Absolutely. incoming because they don't just they they it's kind of like you know boiling water right. for a frog right it boils up and eventually that frog is going to realize hey it's getting pretty warm in this this pot i gotta jump out and you kind of have to think about that when negative thoughts kind of creep in it's not no different in a race than than daily life you have to know that you've got the control of it and i think the last thing i'll say on that is like so what do you get when that negative thought pops in right you get that affirmation you get to be right you get to be right about the fact that that person won a race and it made you feel bad. Mm -hmm. And you get to be upset about it, but it doesn't move you forward. Mm -hmm. Whereas redirecting that and saying, yep, that person won that race. That's awesome for them. I can't wait to go out and train harder or, you know, go and, and put my own work in, mm -hmm. not to go beat them, but to go and say, hey, I want to go and be competitive with this person, especially if you're at, the, at, a, at a level in the sport where you're being competitive with other people in your age group mm -hmm. and things like that. Like, it should be motivating, mm -hmm. but it, it shouldn't be motivating out of spite. Right. Yeah, there's a, there's a big difference there. I think we're, we're three minutes out uh, from, the, from the end of this. And so I appreciate everybody who's joining in. We will put this up on uh, YouTube and a link. Yeah, believe it or not, we are in... 2020 y'all um so we <laughs> will be with a little 2010 but we're, we're in 2020 now <laughs> we're waiting for the next thing i don't know what it's gonna be but um hopefully not smell a vision kidding i got bananas over here they're great um what we're gonna say is that this is something that we're gonna be doing every friday um as kind of a way to not only answer the questions on our team uh but if you're seeing this whether it is on youtube or you're catching this on facebook or wherever it is and kind of catching up with us um please feel free to bring these questions in. If you are not inside our Lifelong Endurance Athletes and Coaches group, go ahead and uh, ask to be accepted into the group. Fill out the questions. That always helps us know why you're here and what you're doing. And come be a part of this conversation. I think what I, we want all of our athletes to know is that this is a resource for them. This is something special that we do. Um, this isn't intended to be a podcast. This isn't intended to be a, a show. This is intended to actually be a resource and be able to be something that when something doesn't feel right, you have a question or you saw something on the internet that made you ask questions. We didn't get to talk about shoes. Shoes are super cool. We'll talk about shoes sometime. But um, it's a resource. And I apologize for being a total like shiny object right there, but that's what I want this to be able to be is a really dynamic conversation um, about training, about everything. Um, that comes with being an endurance athlete. And we get sick of our own voices. So like if you're able to call in and chat yeah. with us or send, send something so we hear what you're thinking, how you feel, yeah. if you disagree, please disagree. Like put that in the comments and yeah, let us know. Yeah. So if, if you guys have comments on this stuff or you gleaned a, a like a word of wisdom or a thought, um, please share that with us. That lets us know that uh, we're not totally crazy and just sitting here talking to each other uh, on the internet. So <laughs> Either way, we appreciate you guys uh, checking in today and we'll look forward to seeing you guys next week. Thanks, y'all. Bye. Yo.